American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle heister Crow, And I'm Tom Crow. Today, we're talking about how the liberation of a French town by General George Patton's army led two Benedictine nuns to found a monastery in the United States with the help of two future sainted popes and how Claire Booth Luce helped turn the whole epic tale into a delightful film, which garnered eight Oscar nominations. As with so many of our stories, there is a lot going on here. Man, I tell you, God is never doing one thing at one time in this small Catholic world. This one begins well before World War II. Vera Duss was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1910. Her father was a native of Pennsylvania, while her mother was originally from Switzerland. When she was still young, her mother took her to Europe, where she grew up in France. She went to school and eventually to the Sorbonne, where she studied to be a surgeon. So she was a very capable student. Yes, she was capable and driven to achieve. But in 1936, the day after graduating, she shocked her family and associates by entering the Benedictine Abbey at Jouar, northeast of Paris. She was given the name Mother Benedict, as it seems all nuns at that monastery are called mother, whether or not they were ever abbess. Entering the monastery didn't mean abandoning her education, though. She taught and served as a doctor, especially in the monastery infirmary. After a time, her mother, Elizabeth Duss, also came to live with the sisters at Juar. And all of this proved to be very important because by the middle of 1940, World War II had come to France and life became very different. It's important to note that Mother Benedict and her mother were still Americans at this point. Mother Benedict by birth and Mrs. Duss by naturalization. Neither had renounced their American citizenship during those many years of living in France. That became more of an issue after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the entry of the United States into the war. With the Nazis already occupying France, any Americans living in France became enemy targets. So Mother Benedict and her mother had to go into hiding. But the monastery couldn't spare Mother Benedict. She was the house doctor, and where would she go? So the monastery at Jouar contrived a number of schemes to conceal the fact that two Americans were living there. It was four very difficult and tense years for Mother Benedict and the Abbey, as discovery would have meant dire consequences for them all. In the summer of 1944, while Mother Benedict was in hiding, basically confined only to her room and the infirmary, she contracted hepatitis herself. It was while she was recovering from this illness that the Americans came. General George S. Patton's Third Army finally liberated Joar on August 27, 1944. And with that, Everything changed for Mother Benedict. Mother Benedict and many other sisters had gone up to the tower of the monastery to watch the coming of the Liberating Army. After four years of Nazi occupation, the sight of the white stars emblazoned on the hoods of the vehicles was a truly remarkable sight. All of the sisters were overjoyed, but Mother Benedict was just undone by the sight of the stars and stripes whipping in the breeze as the G.I.s passed by. When she turned from the sight, she realized that her life was changed. She realized that she no longer felt the connection to France and to Jouar. She realized that she had to give back, to go back to America. She said that the sight she saw that day was, quote, an absolutely astounding experience for me. It shook my foundations, if you will. I realized how much blood had been shed for this liberation, and I had to ask myself, how was I going to match this gift? The only thing I could do was start a foundation of monastic life in America to extend the life-giving work of these men in this country. And that, as they say, was that. Almost. Just to complete the story of that life-changing experience, after she'd gone back down to the infirmary, she was still ill after all, one of the sisters came in to her with a roll of lifesavers, which she'd been given by one of the American soldiers, and this sister thought that Mother Benedict should have the first one. When the sister asked what message she should take back to the soldier, Mother Benedict took one of the pink roses that was in a bedside vase, slightly drooping, and said to give it to him. The sister reported back that when she gave it to the soldier and told him, 
This came from an American nun. The soldiers simply burst into tears. At 34 years old, Mother Benedict had her life's mission. And in faith, she simply trusted that if she remained true to what God had given her to do, God would provide what was needed for the doing. So she set about to keep up her end of the bargain. Mm -hmm. Less than a year later, when the war was finally over in Europe, Mother Benedict finally told the local bishop and her abbess about her new calling. The bishop had a soft spot for her due to emergency medical care she had rendered to him during the war. He happily endorsed her desire. The abbess, however, wasn't keen on the idea, but she gave her blessing and her promise of prayers. The next step was to get permission from the Sacred Congregation for Religious at the Vatican. Permission from the Vatican was needed because this was a fairly new approach to things. Normally, when a Benedictine foundation is made, it happens because a bishop requests that an abbey send some sisters. The bishop who writes is then also expected to provide support, land, money, a building, that sort of thing. But Mother Benedict had none of that. Not a single bishop in the U.S. knew of her desire, let alone had requested that Jouar send any nuns. So the next thing to do was to write to Rome to get permission to go about this a new way. To that end, Mother Benedict began writing that letter to Rome. And this is where the whirlwind of remarkable events and meetings began. If we tried to describe them all in this episode, it would be a half an hour long, easily. So we'll give you the summary. Right. If we related all the amazing details of the story, it would easily be three times as long. So, as Inigo Montoya said, let me explain. There is too much. Let me sum up. First, she developed appendicitis. Not usually how great adventures begin, but in this case, it was a blessing. It meant she had to go to Paris for emergency surgery. She knew that while in Paris, she would have the opportunity to meet with the French ambassador to the Holy See, the philosopher Jacques Maritain. He loved her idea and gave her pointers on how to go about approaching Rome. Providence. The next sticky question was how to finance the trip to Rome. The Abbey was strapped for cash at the time, but just then a surprise letter arrived from a very old friend of Mother Benedict's. It was a letter of apology for being so late in sending the gift she had intended to give years before. It was 25,000 francs, and boom, the trip to Rome was financed. Then the abbess came around to supporting the idea wholeheartedly, so she gave Mother Benedict a very needed letter of endorsement, which she addressed to the Pope to gain his support. But that letter wasn't enough to make it happen in Rome, so she had to meet with the papal nuncio in Paris, and that man was Archbishop Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli. Roncalli loved the idea and handwrote his endorsement directly onto the abbess's letter. Providence again. And nowadays we know Archbishop Roncalli as... Pope St. John the 23rd. So with this document in hand, she went to Rome. Things did not go smoothly there. First, she did meet with the Pope, but he kept the letter. This was a near catastrophe. Enter the Undersecretary of State, Monsignor Giovanni Battista Montini. Montini did two great things for her. First, he gave her guidance on how to replace the document, and he promised that he would endorse the new documents as needed. Providence doesn't always go in a straight line, as we know. Yeah. If it did, we wouldn't need faith. Yeah. Second, Montini talked with her as an interested father about her desire to establish a monastic foundation in America. Right. He talked about how America was largely a Protestant culture and that the contemplative life of a monastic community would be a tough sell in the United States. He recommended that all sisters have some sort of skill or craft that they were excellent at. Mother Benedict took this advice to heart, as we'll see. Mm -hmm. And Giovanni Battista Montini, of course, is now known as Pope St. Paul VI. So they got the permission they needed, plus two visas to enter the United States, and now came the task of actually crossing the ocean and finding a bishop to take them in. Back at Jouar, Mother Benedict and her loyal sidekick, Mother Mary Aline, began figuring how they'd make the crossing. The abbess had selected five additional sisters to join them, but with only one additional visa, those five would have to wait. Now, you mentioned Mother Mary Aline. Just so our listeners know, Mother Mary Aline is just as much the hero of the story as is Mother Benedict. Mother Benedict would not have remained concealed for the four years of Nazi occupation were it not for Mother Mary Aline. And everything that Mother Benedict accomplished up to this point and afterward in America, likewise, would not have happened without Mother Mary Aline's assistance. It's almost like a Frodo Baggins, Samwise Gamgee sort of a thing. <laughs> Absolutely. And 
this is the part of the narrative where we crash into the events which became an Oscar-nominated movie script. Which is crazy because everything which came before this, especially everything that we didn't even talk about, was the stuff of movies. Seriously. The crossing was arranged, Friends of the Abbey helped finance it, and they went to live with two lady artists in Bethlehem, Connecticut, in their home, which they called the Sheepfold. How the connection with the artist came about was another point of providence smiling down on them. The two artists were actually oblates of the Benedictine Abbey of Solem and had been to France a few times. Some friends of the Abbey at Jouar knew them. So these women received the sisters off the boat in New York and brought them to the sheepfold in Bethlehem. They were welcome to stay as long as was needed to establish their foundation. Mother Benedict had hoped to establish her foundation in the Diocese of Richmond, but didn't hear back from the Bishop of Richmond until after arriving in the States, and when he finally did write back, his answer was no. Likewise, the local bishop down in Hartford wasn't keen on the idea. He kept putting off meeting with them and told many people that they were not welcome to establish a foundation in Hartford. He did allow them to remain in the diocese while they worked to put things together. He just hoped that it would happen elsewhere. He also made it known that if they didn't acquire land in short order, that they'd have to pack up and leave. So that made their situation much more urgent. Ah, but then Providence smiled on them again. Mother Benedict desired to take up weaving. She remembered what Monsignor Montini had said about having skills that would be noticed and respected in the local area. So it was fortunate that a neighbor, Mrs. Leather, had a number of looms which she was willing to train Mother Benedict to use. Mrs. Leather's husband, Robert, was a wealthy industrialist, and he owned a nearby piece of land with a lovely hill, a hill which suited the sisters' needs perfectly. Robert Leather was not Catholic. He was a Congregationalist and not particularly religious, but he wanted to be sure that the piece of land, which he regarded as the best in Bethlehem, would remain a place of prayer and peace forever. He had become very impressed with the sisters, so when he heard Mother Benedict telling a fellow guest at a dinner party at his house that the bishop had said the sisters would need to leave if they didn't come up with land, he then and there gave the beautiful hill and its surroundings to the sisters. Everyone gasped. Imagine that. No doubt tears were also shed. Now they had their land, but they needed money, and they still needed the bishop's permission. So they once again requested a meeting. This time, since their request came with the assurance that they had secured the land, he agreed. When the sisters met with him, deed to the property in hand, he was impressed with their story, their resourcefulness, and the land. Though he expressed severe concern about their lack of money, by the end of the meeting he found himself saying, the diocese welcomes you. This part is depicted fairly accurately in the film. The bishop wasn't antagonistic to the sisters, but he was brutally realistic with them about the challenges they would face. In private, however, he confessed to his secretary, an irresistible force has been let loose in New England. <laughs> Boy, was that the truth. So now they had to raise the money to purchase or build the buildings. Fortunately, the two lady artists with whom they were living... I just realized we hadn't said their names yet, Lauren Ford and Francis Delahanty, they were able to get into contact with a lot of well-to-do families because they themselves had come from well-to-do families. So the sisters began sending letters of introduction and a fundraising plea to every Catholic of note that any of them could think of. One connection led to another, and the sisters, while raising money, were also put in contact with an amazing woman whom we've talked about before, Claire Booth Luce. Luce? like the sisters, was a force of nature. We told her story in episode 61. Importantly for this tale, this encounter with the sisters was only a few years after Claire's own conversion to Catholicism. She took to the nun's story. She visited them in Bethlehem as they were establishing their abbey and soon wrote a short story based on their adventure. That short story, in very short order, was reworked into the script for the 1949 movie Come to the Stable. Luce was actually nominated for an Academy Award for her work on that script, but it had some significant differences from the real story. As Claire told the story, the sisters came over to found a children's hospital, which is obviously more compelling than just founding a contemplative abbey that sells handmade blankets, cheeses, preserves, leather, and other crafty things. Again, channeling what Monsignor Montini had said a few years earlier. Exactly. Another major difference was that, in Luce's telling, the land was donated by a New York mobster who had intended to use the land to build a getaway home for himself, but was moved by the sisters' humility and simplicity. And ultimately, he donated it when he found out they had been in France during the war. His own son had been killed in France, so he felt a connection. 
That's a little more dramatic than the real story. Mm. But also it parallels Claire Booth Luce's own story. She had lived a life of indulging in pleasures and asserting her will for the first 41 years of her life until her daughter's tragic death. And it was through the ministrations of Father Fulton Sheen that she came to find solace and comfort in the faith. So maybe Claire saw something of herself in the mobster Rossi and his coming around. Also in the movie, the two lady artists were combined into one, who was played by Elsa Lanchester, and there were other storytelling devices that Luce wove in to make it compelling as a movie, but you'll have to see Come to the Stable yourself to find out how it all comes together. Come to the Stable was nominated for eight Academy Awards, including Best Actress for Loretta Young, herself a Catholic, Best Supporting Actress for both Celeste Holm and Elsa Lancaster, Best Writing, which Claire Booth Luce was named in, but it didn't win any of them. Just to be nominated for that many is still rather impressive. Absolutely. Through all of these efforts, the sisters officially established the priory of Regina Laudis in 1947, with Mother Benedict as prior. In late 1947, the five additional sisters came over from Jouar, and the community began to grow. In 1976, the priory officially separated from the Abbey of Jouar and became an abbey in its own right, with Mother Benedict elected abbess. She became the first American woman to be blessed as a Benedictine abbess, and she would remain abbess until stepping down in 1998, dying in 2005. The abbey continues to pray the divine office, chanting all of the hours daily, and has maintained the vision of the sisters being excellent at valuable skills. The sisters live in the enclosed community, still wearing full habits and extending generous hospitality to many guests throughout the year. They produce cheese, pottery, items made of wood, hand-dipped candles, and they even maintain a blacksmith operation, all of which produce items for sale in their gift shop. They also sell recordings of their chanting and polyphony, and they maintain an outdoor theater which produces a few shows per year. I really got to visit this gift Mm. shop. The theater is the product of perhaps the most famous nun at Regina Laudis, Mother Dolores Hart, who, as many know, was a rising starlet in Hollywood before giving it all up at 24 years old to enter the monastery. We'll definitely be talking about her, too, at some later date. Absolutely. Nowadays, the Abbey of Regina Laudis has about 40 sisters, which includes a number of recent vocations. They are nearing completion of the first major renovation of their buildings since moving into it in 1948, when they converted an old brass polish factory into what was supposed to be temporary living quarters. When this project is complete, they will have a new chapel and an abbey building that will last well into the future. And all of it because Mother Benedict never stopped believing that she was doing God's will. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. And we ask you to consider supporting the work of SQPN. Yes, now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron. Thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter, when you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So if you become a new patron at $10 per month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all our shows, including American Catholic History, making your gift go even further. If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. To learn more about Regina Lauri's Abbey and the story of its founding, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, please visit sqpn.com slash history. We also love feedback and hearing about cool Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. Mm-hmm.